Oh man, did I get it right? Do I have the thing set up? And this needs to go up here. And let's do this over here. I think I got the thing. I think I got the thing. It's set up, right? And there I am. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it might be in your part of the world. Welcome back to the live stream. My name is Jeff Fritz. This is C Sharp with C Sharp Fritz. This is a discussion focused. Uh, a live stream, you're going to be watching the recording perhaps, where we're going to talk about learning Blazor. We're going to have a, a <clears throat> excuse me, we're, we're going to have a discussion here where we're going to learn about some of the cool features of Blazor with .NET 8 so that you can learn to build web applications and, and have a good time getting engaged and, and being productive with this new web framework that's available from our friends at Microsoft. Uh, let me say hello to our, our to the the folks that are out there watching in the chat room. Um, hello, hello, chat room. Let me bring them up. It is uh, make sure I get this one right. Right? Is it this one? Is it that one? I think it's this one. Yeah, there we go. There's the chat room there, right over here. Hello, hello. Um, <laughs> uh, it's good to see folks popping in here. Um, my gosh, let me start up at the top. Jay with a question from YouTube. I'll, I'm, I'm, I've, I've pinned that question. We will come back to that in just a few minutes. Um, I want to make sure I greet some folks here. Lanky Scottish nerd. Good day to you. Surly dev. Hello. I am not omnipotent. Oh my goodness. Um, Harrison on YouTube asks, I hope that I go over storing a bearer token from identity. We're not doing security today but it's going to be coming up and we will be talking about how to connect security, how that's going to fit into things here as we, we move along. Um, it's definitely part of the agenda as, as we get into things here. Um, continuing here, let me, I've, I've got tag zap running over here and I'm trying to keep an eye on things coming in from the chat room and it looks like something happened we got disconnected there we go now we're getting messages um 
Let me see here. Adrian and Antonina, hello to you in Madagascar. Lanky Scottish nerd is right. Authentication and authorization is just a little bit outside the scope of what we're going to be talking about today. Robson Praviato is here on Twitch. Hello to you in Brazil. Thank you so much for watching. Steve is watching from Germany. Frank is 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 tuned in from Cuba. Hello, hello. Coffee and coding. Very good evening to you. It's midnight in Australia. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. How you doing there, Wayne in California? Thank you so much, folks that are staying up late. Really appreciate it. Uh, Surly Dev is watching from Lancashire, England. Um, I, I got a problem with our our Wrexham AFC squad over there in Wales. Coming up with a nil-nil result last night. I don't know about that. Um, but, uh, is it Barak is here? They're Vietnamese. Hello, and you'd like to do DevOps. Great. Not quite on the agenda for today. We'll get into some DevOps topics around Blazor as we go through this series. We will definitely be covering deployment, continuous integration, a little bit of uh, GitHub Actions, a little bit of Azure DevOps as we get later in the series. Right now, we're working on those key development topics. Um, how you doing there? Sadiit in India. Hello. Uh, Aqualek. I, I hope I pronounce folks' names properly. Um, hello to you in South Africa. Um, continuing here. Mahir is here from Macedonia. Hello. Hello. Um, is it Sisad? Says, the problem with .NET and Blazor is that it is changing so fast. Once you learn something one year later, it's so different. Let me tell you something. Can I, let me, let, let's just, let, let's just uh, dial that in for a second here. And, and I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to go and, and activate uh, AMA mode here. Set a timer for 40 minutes. So, and uh, let's, let's talk a little bit about about some of that and we've got uh we've got tag zap running here so that i can pin some of your messages that are coming in and make sure that we get to these um so let's start with this comment um problem with net and blazer is that it's moving so fast once you learn something a year later it is so different so here's the thing here's the thing this can be said about just about any technology as net developers we've been quite privileged. We've been quite, uh, we, we, we've, we've received quite the gift from the Microsoft team that .NET technologies, when they do advance, are extremely backwards compatible. Here's the thing. Talk to Python developers about the migration from Python 2 to Python 3. Talk to JavaScript developers about the migration from AngularJS to Angular. Talk about, um, react developers around some of the licensing challenges that they have talk to node developers about how quickly various libraries come and go out of favor you are thank you microsoft i appreciate you interrupting my live stream here so that you can force me to reboot we're not going to do that right now here's the deal all technologies change that's the only constant in this space when you get in and you decide that you want to work with technology whether it's mobile devices it's the cloud it's desktop devices doesn't matter what it is technology is always changing nothing is constant yes there are companies out there that are still running their entire business off of a mainframe that they bought in the 1970s buying hardware writing applications and expecting them to last 50 years without modification is not realistic. Things change. Security issues happen. New technologies advance. Are you really connecting to that mainframe with an iPad? No. If you are, there's a series of shims in front of it that you built. Yes, you didn't modify the mainframe, but you build a bunch of stuff in front of it so you could open a terminal connection and get into the mainframe. You're not using the mainframe directly. You've built a bunch of things in front of it. That technology has changed and advanced so that you could adapt and support folks who are using phones and tablets and watches with your technology. This is going to happen for everybody, for every technology. And working in the web space, things move even faster because 
everybody's got input and and goals that they want to reach so stuff changes stuff changes a lot and and we we aren't even getting into some of the geopolitical changes that get forced upon us as technologists not just hey we got to move the technology forward because we want to support cool new feature or hardware x y and z but then a government comes in, in and says hey you know what we're changing what daylight savings time is hey you know what we're not going to allow you to ship data like that Hey, you need to start asking questions about privacy before you can start letting folks log into your application. Hey, you need to prompt people whether or not they can save cookies into your browser because when they engage with your application. Stuff changes. Let me get some music playing in the background here and we'll get things set up and we'll have some fun here today. I'm going to play the Stream Beats Synthwave playlist here in the background. This is music that's DMCA free. It's royalty free. Listen to it wherever you'd like. Check it out at streambeats.com. Big thanks to Harris Heller and his team of creators for making this music we're listening to today. Uh, let me continue to, to greet some of the folks here. Hello, uh, Albert in Toronto. Uh, Sinan is here from Istanbul, Turkey. Um, Gabe is a German uh, living in Thailand. How you doing there? Big Daddy McCoy in Knoxville, Tennessee. Love Knoxville. Love Knoxville. It can be a headache. That's right, Sisad. Yes. Hello. I'm sorry. I can't read your name in Moscow. Um, .NET Cloud. What is which best titch? Um, are you? I, I'm sorry. There's too many questions here. I I need a little bit more. What you're looking for there? Give me some more discussion here. They made a bit of a mess when handling state when using auto rendering mode. That's there's a whole there's a whole thing coming there. Um, how you doing there? Oh, Alan, uh, this one here. Let me grab Wayne's message. Um, da, 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 da. hello, gatekeeper in Indonesia. Australia is where Steven is. Hello, uh, guacamole. Good morning to you. Hello to Eric in Ireland. Let me jump back over here to the waterfall. Let's queue up some of these. Um, so, um, Harrison, on YouTube is asking about being able to see bearer tokens with identity APIs coming later on in the in the series. We're absolutely going to be covering. We'll have a whole stream focused on just security. Definitely coming soon. Um, Wayne with this comment, they've made a bit of a mess with handling state when using auto rendering mode. No, no. There's, the, we're not going to get into auto rendering mode. We're going to focus on WebAssembly uh, state management today. And we're going to show you a little bit of the interesting things about that. Because when you, when you think about the various rendering modes that we've been learning in Blazor, when things render on the server or things render in the browser, where you manage the current state of the user, where you store their preferences, the, the current we're going to see today the current things that are in their shopping cart. How you want them to experience that is different based on your application. Do you, do you want their state to follow them when they're using WebAssembly? Do you want their state, which means then that it's tied to their browser. So if they're working in Microsoft Edge and they open a Chrome browser, it's not the same shopping cart. Or do you want it to follow them on the server so that when they are in Chrome and they open Microsoft Edge, ah, they see the same shopping cart. Furthermore, when they pick up their phone and they, they start to browse, do they see the same shopping cart? Ah, then we want to keep it on the server. Or is there a mix of the two that we want to, we want to consider? Ah, now there's even more complexity. With great power comes great responsibility the same can be said the the corollary in tech with great flexibility comes a whole lot of code you gotta write and that's just the way it is and we're gonna see some of that over the next stream or two um Sasad says all texts do change very quickly i feel often the same things are invented with a different name this is absolutely happening as folks in other tech stacks start to discover things that other tech stacks have. Generics in the C-sharp programming language 
were easily brought into TypeScript because they're written by the same guy. It's the same, the same language design team that build and manage both languages. So when generics come into Java, when some of these other features and link you see starting to come into other languages, right? They're inspired and folks say, hey, I really want this feature. Yeah, they bring it over. Um, Gabe says, I understand you can keep your old Blazor code with .NET 8, even with the new server-side rendering and auto options. You betcha. You can just straight update your version numbers of your libraries and your application will just work. When you want to take advantage of some of the new, um, the new capabilities, the new rendering options are key amongst those features, you will have to do some rewriting. There's no two ways about that. Catching up here. Uh, hello, Mohammed in New York. Um, I will grab this one. Do, 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 do. Uh, I'll grab this one. I'll grab that one. Um, sure, we'll grab this. And I'll grab Thindall's message there as well. Um, do, do, do. Let's start with Mohammed here in the top right. Do I recommend Dapper with Blazor for a large application? I recommend you use the, the data access technology that you're comfortable with. Entity Framework can be really good at doing simple CRUD into a database table. It can be really good with that. However, as soon as you want to do some denormalizing, you want to start to do some, some alternate data structures than the kinds of structures that Entity Framework will create and maintain for you, you're going to want to write some user-defined functions or stored procedures that run in your database. At that point, Dapper executing those stored procedures is a fantastic choice. Either way, I recommend repository pattern so that you isolate in one location how you're using Dapper, how you're using Entity Framework to interact with your database. Furthermore, as we're seeing in our sample application here, when you choose to move some of your data access interactions into a WebAssembly portion of the application, well, now instead of querying with Dapper or Entity Framework directly from inside your component, now you need to use an HTTP client to request that. Or... Maybe you'd like to deploy some of your data access capabilities into a microservice somewhere so you can reuse it across multiple applications. By wrapping your data access in repository pattern, you then have that data access isolated and you can choose to use Entity Framework or Dapper or HTTP clients or whatever other technology to fetch and interact with that data. It gives you that flexibility so the dependency injection with the repository pattern means you can choose Dapper now if you want. You can change it to Entity Framework later and your user interface is none the wiser. So do I recommend it? At some point. At some point. Why not? Sure. Um, continuing over here, Survivor28 says HTTP context is null in interactive WebAssembly mode. Um, make sure you're logged in properly and you're passing your security um, and, and make sure that your, your security context is properly coming down. Um, HTTP context should be a cascading parameter that you're receiving. Make sure you have the, I forget the security piece. There's a cascading value that you wrap in routes inside your web assembly to get this to work. Um, we do this very well inside the tag zap application. If you want to see some sample source code that shows that this application that you're looking at right here continuing on um and we'll get in and we'll do some more um we, we'll we'll talk more about that we'll show more about this tomorrow when we're working in tags app um and when we get into the security episodes we'll absolutely be diving into that um survivor if, if you'd like to share a message if you'd like to uh, dig in further have a little bit of Q&A. Um, you can join me on my Discord server, 
We set up a, a redirect URL for that. You can get to my Discord server now. Check this out. Uh, at discord.csharpfritz.com. Um, Steven asks, will I be covering entities and DTOs? That's a little bit more of an architecture discussion. So I'm not covering those directly. We're going to be using some DTOs as part of this. Um, but we're, I'm not going into the architecture discussion between these during this, during this series. This is a, a web framework series, teaching and learning about the web framework. That kind of architecture discussion is just a little bit off the path. Uh, Thindall says, when doing interactive mode web assembly or auto, you need to assume you can't do anything on the server. Absolutely. Um, Dennis, with a question here, I hope to talk about recreating state after reboot of server so users barely notice the server changed or failover. This is a really good question. I'm going to take, uh, I'm going to take a, a uh, note on this for a... Uh, possible follow-up okay I don't have it in the queue for today but uh, recreating state uh, after reboot that's a very good uh, good question I think there's there's several things that that we can talk about with that including how um, blazer interactive server mode uh, how it does its reconnection you can customize that. That's actually something we want to customize in Tag Zap as well. But this is uh, something I'll take and and I'll look at for a follow up in a future episode. Um, trying to keep the server stateless is absolutely a good strategy here. Storing things, storing state uh, in a database so so that if the server does need to be restarted, you can still pull the state back from the database. Pretty good strategy as well. Let's uh, let's catch up here. Uh, Blazor is stateful to begin with. It is. So you can store state in the browser as well. So can you reverse scaffold with Dapper? Uh, don't know. Don't know. Um, let me see here. Um, do, 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 do. Thank you, Thindall, for the uh, message there. Uh, recommended Discord group. Thank you, Big Daddy McCoy. Yes. We've had some pretty good conversations. And and I want to do some refactoring of the Discord server. I meant to do it over the weekend, but I got distracted with a couple things and I was out of town on Sunday. Um, that's a good... Um, <laughs> let's, uh, let's catch up on a couple more questions that have come in here. Love the questions coming in. Let me know what you think of Tags app here how we're using this panel to discuss and, and come back to your questions because I want to make sure everybody sees your question and when your folks are watching the recording, um, we can come back and highlight some of these things as well and it's a little bit easier to pick up on this. Um, Maran on YouTube. How you doing there, Maran? I uh, always use ADO and write all of my SQL myself. I have to run on Oracle and SQL Server on multiple database instances where the schema is not necessarily in sync. Ooh. Okay, using multiple multiple database uh, database providers here. Absolutely, you're in a scenario where where I I would one hundred percent be wrapping things. And you, I, I'm a big preacher of repository pattern because if you decide to move some things from Oracle to SQL Server and back again or somewhere else, this is. A, a fantastic real world scenario where you're going to want to push that logic for maintaining these things somewhere else. Thank you for sharing, Maran. Yes, that great uh, real world example there. Thank you. That's cool. That's very cool. Um, Gabe with a comment here since I'm working at Microsoft. Well, I'm not working at Microsoft. I work for Microsoft. I, I work here in the cloud, in, in, in the video services. Right, I'm 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 just a guy with a ugly Xbox hat sitting in the corner of a video. But here we go. Are there going to be some Microsoft Learn certifications as there are for Azure professionals? So there is a C Sharp certification that you can get um, in a collaboration that we have with Free Code Camp. 
Um, there have been similar requests for other certifications around .NET technologies. Um, we're prioritizing and, and scheduling and building those as quickly as we can. I have nothing to announce at this time, but we're working on more because we, we hear you. Um, I gotta be careful not to do the Katie Britt. We hear you. No, sorry. Um, Big Daddy McCoy recommends the Discord. So discord.csharpfritz.com. That'll get you in. And uh, yeah, there's the, the, there's been some discussion off and on there, but we're, we're leveling it up. Um, we're going to have some better isolated areas for talking about the projects we're working on, asking for help around various topics. Um, I tried to jump in and do some office hours last night, and it, it didn't feel quite right to me, so... Um, I'll be, a, I'm, I'm definitely around on the, the, the discord server and responding to folks questions. Uh, Marat asks, I hope I'm going to cover on on-premise hosting. Nowadays, there's a lot of Azure pushing. I hear you. Um, I will make sure that I, um, add that to the on-premise hosting, uh, to the hosting discussion. Um, Building and delivering on on premise should be very easy to do because you can, with all of our .NET web technologies, you can build for a container. Um, so scaffold host in your own Kubernetes instances. You can build, publish, and deploy into IIS if you'd like to do that. Um, if you'd like to deliver and run, um, if you'd like to deliver and run on a Linux server, we have instructions for how to do that. I'll make sure that I cover this when we get to the hosting session, hosting and deployment sessions, which will be a few weeks out, but it's, it's on the schedule um, of topics. Yes. Fantastic. Uh, continuing here. How do you store open ID tokens to you and use them later to query a secured API? Spoilers coming up. Um, We'll be doing this uh, in the security sessions that we're going to have. I think it's about two weeks out. About two weeks out, we'll be covering this in the security sessions. Um, if you if you want to see how I do this with Tags App, with the application here behind me, because I am, you can see here, um, I am logged in as, hey, look, there's my email, as uh, with my Microsoft token to this Blazor application. You can absolutely see the source code, how this is done um, on my Tuesdays and Thursday streams. Okay. Happy to go through and discuss those. Discord link doesn't work. What do you mean Discord link doesn't work? Right? Uh, Discord, C sharp frets, come. Yeah, there it is. Try that again. Click that link. It worked for me just there. Um, tag zap and restream. Oh, fantastic. I'm glad you're liking that. Um, let me see here. Tag zap is in good use. Fantastic. Glad you like that. Uh, hey, pause. Uh, random Clippy in Seattle. Don't know about that. Uh, a GitHub link to the tag or Blazing Pizza app. Um... So you can go to Fritz and Friends. Uh, there's Tag Zap, and um, I'll give you the link to the the workshop that we're working through here in uh, just a little bit when I put that up on on the uh, on screen. Uh, you can run directly on the metal. That's right. Um, da, 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 da. Yeah, Discord link worked for a few folks. Getting a DNS error. Uh, do a hard refresh. I updated the DNS for that over the weekend, so it should be coming through. I do have a great blazer and clippy cons costume. Link work for Steve. Okay. So, three more messages. Tried to join the server using Discord UI. Oh, yeah. Click the click the button, click the link, and it'll jump you right through. I, I don't have a, a rated Discord server, so it won't pop through. Um... Life events and, and marriage trends vlog. How's Dapper? How will it work with Blazor? Works great. 
works fantastic. We've used it in the past and had great success with it. What what questions do you have about that? Because Dapper does work fantastic with it. Um, on YouTube, Alan asks, why is a .NET 8 app running on Azure Linux slower than its Windows counterpart? Is Microsoft deliberately slowing down Linux web app instances? No, we're not. Tell me more. I Give me some content. YouTube chat is is not a good place to discuss this type of thing. Um, drop me a line on the Discord server. Drop me drop me a tweet. Um, let's talk about this. In fact, the Linux app should run faster on the same hardware, on the same allocation of processor and memory. It absolutely should not be running slower. Um, here we go. Here comes some more messages. Uh, have I tried Fluent UI in Blazor? Tested, and it's awesome, but lacks tutorials. Totally agree it lacks tutorials. The Fluent UI folks um, need a little bit of help. They do have... Um, right? They do have samples um, out there. Microsoft Fluent UI Blazor. And there is fluentui-blazor.net. And on a, th there's a handful of YouTube videos here, but I mean, the examples are here and they're kind of structured the same way that you see samples for things like the bootstrap framework and, and other frameworks out there. So what more are you looking for in a tutorial? Like for a user interface framework, this type of, Hey, here's what it looks like when it's rendered. And here's the razor to make that happen. Here's the markup to, to do that. That feels useful along with, here's a list of all the parameters you can pass in and what they do. So I feel like this is a pretty thorough set of documentation. It's not a tutorial per se. Um, so help me out. What, what are you looking for in a, in a tutorial and Maybe there's something that we can do there to, to improve things. So that is for those that are interested in the Fluent UI. There's the link to Fluent UI for Blazor. Um, let me see. Let me get a couple of here. Um, all right. Bring up a couple more questions. Do, 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 do. Here we go from Steven on YouTube. Are there things in Azure to prevent me from getting a large bill for hosting a SQL Server database? Yes, there are. There are budget constraints that you can set up on your um, on your account. You can you can set up alerts and budgets so that as the cost goes up through the month of for your Azure account, you can you can receive notification emails that say hey you're at 75 percent of your budget you're at 90 percent of your budget so you can decide to scale back the use of your resources and if you hit your budget maximum for the month it will shut off services so that you're done you've spent all the money you can for the month and and it won't charge you any further than what you've said is your maximum allowed um Jim I. Scott asks, or is it Jimmy Scott asks, uh, looking forward to getting into state management. We're, we're going to talk a bit about that today. We need to catch up and finish a little bit of what we started last time. And then we're going to get into, um, we're going to get into state management today. Uh, Moran says, IIS is and, and, and or was great. Yeah. No downtime, no client interruption when upgrading web applications. How would you do this with a .NET 8 monolith? GRP is still not supported on a GRPC, not supported on IIS. Um, I think the issue is IIS doesn't support HTTP 2. I can't remember. Um, how would you do this with a .NET 8 monolith? So several ways to do that. The easiest way to do it is stand up a secondary instance of your application and do a DNS swap. You can do this very easily with Azure App Service. Other cloud services have similar features where you deploy and it stands it up. And it'll stand up your application in a staging slot 
in, in a secondary hosting location. And when you can verify that everything's working properly, and then you can push a button and it will swap the staging in the live instance so that what was staging is now live and there's no downtime. It, it will bleed off, right? It'll drain users off of the live instance and put them on what was the stage instance. So there's absolutely features to help you with that. Thindall chimes in and says, lacking tutorials is unfortunately a recurring theme when it comes to a lot of component libraries. Professional and paid for and free ones as well. It's one of the weaker parts of every one I've come across. Yeah, it's not a question of writing documentation. It's a question of how do you write a tutorial that shows off 80 plus components? Like, do you really want a tutorial or do you want sample pages that show here's the things in use and here's how they were configured? Like, a lot of developers just want to be given the answer of how do I use this component? How do I use this widget to return this user interface capability? I like the way that thing looks. How do I do that? So, um, that's, that's in, from my perspective, as somebody who used to work for a component vendor, that was where we were, uh, we were focused. Um, let's see here. Let's grab next two questions. Albert on YouTube. I'm interested in Fluent UI, but it is still having the issue to make it work on Android. The workaround did not work for me. I, I do, I'm sorry. I haven't worked with the library enough that I can speak towards how it appears and works on Android. Um, Daniel. Uh, says Mudblazer looks by far much more mature than Fluent UI. It is. Mudblazer is a user interface framework. Oh, it built and managed by folks in the community that have been working on it since the beginning. Fluent UI was migrated over by Microsoft folks um, from being used in various other frameworks, and it's um, it's it's just a a maintenance thing because the Fluent UI team manages many different frameworks that uh, that that design system is uh, is built for um, on YouTube WM asks do I know any blazer CMS for .NET web API with MongoDB a, a blazer content management system with .NET web APIs and MongoDB no I don't know of one off the top of my head no um why blazer like the, this is something that could be built this is something that might be a fun open source project for folks to build um what are your thoughts it, what what gets you interested in this let me know let's let's talk about that a little bit so um, <laughs> queue up a couple more questions here. What do I think about using MVVM in Blazor? Well, Blazor, by the very nature of how the Razor template engine works, with the various state has changed interactions, um, gets you pretty close to MVVM user interface architecture. Gets you close. It's not entirely there. If MVVM makes you happy, go for it. I think it's a it's a fine pattern. Um, I I just kind of use whatever. I don't really use a design pattern with my user interfaces in Blazor. Um, but it, it's a fine pattern to help force a structure and and allow you to um, to to build a testable user interface where you can pull various components out and test them. So it's not a bad idea, Steve. Um, Eric with a question here. Isn't the web engine, uh, Kestrel, I believe you're referring to, uh, it is supported in production? Yes. Uh, is it supposed to replace IIS? No. So uh, Windows Internet Information Server, IIS, is an enterprise-grade web server 
that that's been hardened over years and years and has integration with Active Directory, with Windows authentication. If you want to enable those types of interactions with the Windows ecosystem and your Blazor or .NET application, you're going to need to host on IIS. Definitely, um, definitely a feature, definitely something that's fully supported. Um, and it, it speaks towards that flexibility of what we can do with .NET. Um, last time I was building and working in full Visual Studio 2022. Today we're going to build and work in Visual Studio Code and uh, compile and work a little bit at the command line. So I'm, I'm going to make my way around to various ecosystems and environments so that you see you can be productive and work on these samples the 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 lessons that we're teaching doesn't matter <clears throat> what operating system what editor you're using you can be productive and work in them if you tune into my streams on tuesdays and thursdays this is this is a theme month that i host every year that i call minimal march and we uh we we build and work completely at the command line all month long. So I've been on Linux using Vim with Blazor this month. Um, so to, um, <clears throat> we're going to be getting on to a Raspberry Pi and working from a Raspberry Pi in the next week. Um, and then eventually we'll be on a Chromebook as well because you can build and work on a Chromebook. Uh, let me grab a couple more of these questions here. Uh, is it Reggie on YouTube? How you doing there? Is Blazor WebAssembly harder than Blazor Server? What do you mean by harder? Um, harder is an interesting adjective here, right? More difficult to learn? Is it more, is it trickier to understand? Is it uh, more processor intensive? What do you mean by harder? <clears throat> um, give me give me some details on this. So, uh, Robson with a question about the last uh, session that we had together here was working with the sample from last time. Notice that the rendering is causing a, a second database hit. Yes, trying to avoid that, and I ended up using WebAssembly globally instead of per page, and I don't think I catch the whys. I love this question. Thank you, Robson. You're right. You are hitting the database twice. In, in Blazor, when you host an application that has WebAssembly components, what it will do is it will pre-render those pages with WebAssembly. When it pre-renders those, it's going to go through and everything in the on initialized, on parameter set, and on after render. Those events all fire, and it will... Um, it will capture that HTML, cache it, and display that immediately from the server, okay? When the WebAssembly application is ready to go, it hands off processing to the WebAssembly, and, and you'll see a, a slight flash in the user interface when WebAssembly takes over. There's ways around this, including disabling the pre-rendering instead of going to the database to get data that you're going to present the first time on the page, fetch it from a cache somewhere, put it in memory so that it's easier to fetch. There's things like that that we can do. This isn't a, a th this is a real good question and, and Robson, I'm glad you're following along and you picked up on that because this is absolutely something that folks should understand. And in some cases it's okay. It's just fine. Um, you should know, that, that that does happen. Um, let me catch up just a couple more here. Um, yeah, caching will still cause a little bit of a flicker on page. It will. Yep. Uh, <laughs> Gabe asks, Vim, will there be a stream with the Primogen? No, sorry. No. Uh, much respect to him and, and his Vim editor skills, but no. 
Uh, Steven on YouTube asks, how is Blazor supported in is, support in VS Code? Is it the same as Visual Studio? Um, it is, but the Visual Studio interactions, I think, are just a little bit better. Um, VS Code has just about the same editor. They're, they should be in lockstep. There's, there's a, a few minimal differences there. Um, I prefer um, Blazor in Visual Studio. You'll run into scenarios in VS Code where it doesn't have up to, it doesn't have the um, the content and and the parsing of the C sharp code in sync, and you need to force a refresh to get it to pick up some of those things. Um, Gerson on YouTube uh, says, with Blazor WebAssembly, I can access local devices like IoT. Um, you're in the same sandbox that you're in. When you, when you build and develop with JavaScript. So can you reach out to other APIs and things on the local device? If they're exposed at, with a port, sure, you can request them, but you, you can't reach in, reach outside the, the sandbox and, and access those sensors and things directly. You're gonna need something in front of them to interact with. We're coming to the end of my AMA time here. Um, Pre-render, if enabled, works the same in Blazor Server too. Time Bender, you're right. We're gonna do a little Blazor Server, interactive server today. Let me see if I can grab just a few more questions. Um, looks like I'll just grab this one from Survivor and then we'll move on. For a Blazor web app, is it possible to set it so initially everything is delivered via Blazor server, then the whole app will be WebAssembly after load with some components with server interactive? Yes. Spoilers! Coming up, not today, coming up. We're going to get into that. We're going to get into that. H for games, time for some Blazor with Fritz. Well, thank you. There's my timer. 40 minutes for the for the AMA is up. Thank you so much. Really enjoy the questions. Um, I will keep Tag Zap out here. Um, and uh, we can absolutely get back into, into some of that later. Uh, Daniel, when navigating from one page to another page that has to do some heavy tasks like loading data, busy animation doesn't work. Instead, you keep seeing the leaving page until the other page is ready. Watch what we do today. Daniel, you're running right into what we're gonna do today. <laughs> that's exactly what we're gonna talk about today. Like, yes, that's right. <laughs> you're, I, th there's nothing more for me to say. Yeah, we're gonna do that. Um, let me do this. Let me, yeah, I'm just going to move tag zap down there. All right. Um, I will be keeping an eye on, on chat. I won't be keeping as close an eye on it. So, uh, folks that are moderators, folks that are VIPs, if you can help out with some of the questions, that'd be fantastic. Uh, Eric imagines, uh, Jeff in an Eric world in, in a world with multiple monitors. I've got to show you how I code when I'm in VR. Maybe I'll do that during during office hours on Discord at some point here. I will absolutely show that. Maybe I can even record like a like a two minute YouTube video showing folks around the VR space because that's exactly what I do. With my Quest headset. I've ordered another, there's a new headset coming out called Visor. I have a referral. Uh, link if folks are interested in checking that out and want to buy one of those. They're not, they're, it's coming out, you can pre order it now, but it's got higher resolution than the Apple Vision Pro, they claim. Haven't seen it yet, um, but I am very excited to see that. Made by the same folks that use the app that I use, Immersed VR on the headset. Really good stuff. Um, you still want to see the VR setup? Oh, yeah. Surly Dev. Maybe later today, th this afternoon, I'll I'll jump in or at the very least rec record something and show it. So uh, the link to the so 
browse to the uh, discord.csharpfritz.com. Open that up in your web browser, and it'll get you through to the Discord server. Um, this is Blazing Pizza Workshop. There we go. And I should open... I, I have to... I have to do some doc updates on this, but I will share this link for the workshop. Let's head back over to, I don't think that's it. Is that it? Is that my, is that the right page? I think it is. Ah, there, yes it is. Okay. This is the, uh, the source code that we're working through. You can see I was tidying some things up last night. Um, but this is the Blazing Pizza Workshop. It's updated for .NET 8. I need to put it into some better folders. But there's a couple of tags here for the various episodes that we're going through. The start, where we ended when we were working on the home screen in that our last episode. And two, this is the, uh, the, the state that, where we end at the conclusion of our state session here today. Okay, I was going to say, uh, the next episode should be started. The, the next song uh so i'm working at i'm going to work at the command line today and i'm going to work in visual studio code because i want you to see that you can do that you don't have to be in visual studio this same experience works on mac works on linux i'll try and use the mac and, and linux uh, on other episodes in this series because it's important to me you're important to me okay it's important to me that you feel comfortable using your favorite tools on whatever operating system, whatever hardware you have to build and work with .NET. We've, we've gone to great lengths to make sure that all the code, all of the applications work wherever you are, okay? Um, just get a couple things moved around here. You hope Microsoft is not replacing Visual Studio with Visual Studio Code? Not happening, Moran. No, it's that's not happening. But we we do support and, and have multiple editors for folks that have different needs for how they build and work with their applications. Um, let me... So uh, uh, here's my list of tags here. So I'm going to go back to one home screen. Thank you. Um, and... I'm going to open Visual Studio Code for this folder. Hello. There it is. I didn't finish last time showing how to actually finish buying a pizza in the user interface. Let me start the application here. Um, and I'm going to start it with a... Let's do this. Uh, let's split the terminal. You can see I did Alt-Shift-Minus to split the terminal. This is Windows Terminal. I'm using Oh My Posh. That's how I've got the power lines here. My configuration is available on my GitHub if you'd like to download and try this out. This configuration, in including even my background wallpaper. Um, where was I? So down here, I'm going to drop back into Blazing Pizza Workshop. And I'll just scoot that down a little bit up here. Um, I'm going to pop into the blazing pizza folder and I will .NET watch um, I'm do, 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 do. Uh. all right here we go so there's this is the blazing pizza website fantastic order your favorite pizzas now operators are standing by is hot reload coming to vs code i'm going to show you how you can use hot reload right now and you don't need it like dot net watch boom done um so we finished going through online um configuring and setting up our pizza customization here so that you can add pizzas to the, the side panel here. Let me squeeze that down just a little bit more so you can see the order button down there at the bottom. Um, so 
here's here's the deal, right? This order button, we need to have that process and actually save data. And I want this little X button to also remove pizzas from the cart. That's pretty easy to do. So we know that when we placed, pressed that order button, we put together inside of my configure pizza dialog, right? We had a, not the toppings. Here we go. Here's the order button. And we wanted to be able to say, hey, confirm and do something with this. So we already know how to set up an on-click handler here. And we also set up an on-click handler for cancel. But we have them pointing to these things. Um, on cancel, on confirm, right? Well, those are actually set up as parameters. And we do that so that you can set for this component, right? For that modal UI that pops up, right? I want to be able to pass in to this window what I want these two buttons to do. So if I want to pass them in from somewhere else, I need to pass in a delegate, okay? I need to pass in a pointer to a method that's going to be executed later. So that's what this event callback is that you see here, okay? Event callback is a delegate. It's a pointer to another method that we can execute when we call on confirm or on cancel, right? When we execute these properties, because click happened here, it will go and execute whatever's passed into it. So if I back up to the home page here and we scroll down to here's my configure pizza dialog, I'm passing in two methods for on cancel and on confirm. So cancel pizza dialog, here's the method. So I want the inner window, right? The window component to call this, clear out the configuring the pizza that we're working on and hide the configure pizza dialog. Nice. That's pretty easy to follow. And the confirm, well, if the pizza that we're working on, if there is really a pizza there, right? Add that pizza to our orders and clear out the pizza that we were working on, hide the configure dialog. Nice. Um, Locarno on, on Twitch is asking about editor required. What's that editor required um, that, that we have there? Is that something that we should use almost like a required parameter? So here, editor required. Um, it is effectively a required parameter. Yes. Um, but if you, if you put required on, on these uh, parameters you're going to run into an issue where you need to have an initial value set here to work with. And um, that might not be exactly what you want. So by doing editor required, it'll kind of force the issue up front, right? And at build time that, hey, this isn't, uh, th there isn't a value supplied for this. You're missing a value. So editor required forces you to include. So because I have that editor required there, right? If I go back to my configure pizza dialog, if I remove one of these, I now get my editor telling me, oh, wait a sec, you're missing something. It expects a value for the parameter on cancel. Okay. I make sure that that parameter is defined. Yellow line goes away. All right, so that's what editor required does. It it helps to tell you, hey, you're you're missing a value that should be assigned. The last thing that we built and added was at the bottom we had that order pizza button, right? So this place my order button here. So on click, we want to place the order. Well, that. We have a, a pizza store object that we've been passing around, right? I've been using a repository pattern here to define this. So I have a place order method defined. 
See, here we go. I can't F12 into it. I have a place order method defined on that. But because I'm in WebAssembly, it doesn't, it, it needs to know how do I go and push that order into the database. So I updated place order so that it says HTTP client post this JSON async to the orders API, my order. That's it. Done. So it'll upload all the contents of your order. It'll turn it into JSON, post it out to the server so that it's saved to the database. Not bad. Easy to follow. That's where we left off last time. That gets you up to speed with where the the tag um, where the tag one home screen left off. Now let's start to do a little bit more around managing state and interacting with the application here. Okay. Um, because there's, there's things that we're going to want to start doing with our pizzas. So after you place the order, I'd like to be able to see the state of my order. I'd like to be able to see the list of the orders that I've made in the past so I can interact with them. So let's start doing that. I'm going to start adding content for a new page to show um, the, the list of orders that we have. And then we're going to manage state and, and navigate around a little bit and show that we need to manage that cart a little bit more diligently. So inside my application over here, right? Right now, I just have a, a single page, get pizza. Well, if I want to show a list of the pizzas that I have, I should have another menu bar item up here that says, show me my previous orders. So I'm going to go into the layout. And our layout, if you remember, is being managed up here in my server part of the application called just Blazing Pizza. And there's my main layout. And there's the navigation button for that get pizza button. So let's add a my orders button and I'll just copy this in. So it's just a simple anchor. It's going to go to a page called my orders. It's going to be a navigation tab. It's going to have a little bike SVG as its icon and we'll show the text my orders. So um, I have automatic save set up so it does periodic saving in Visual Studio Code for me. So if I navigate back over to the user interface, it's already been patched and hot reloaded to the question that we saw earlier because I'm running .NET watch here at the command line. You see hot reload succeeded. Okay. And it added, it added my button. And if I click the button, it doesn't go anywhere yet because I don't have a my orders page. So let's add a my orders page and I'm going to add it to the server. So I'll just go up here and inside my pages, I'm going to add a new file called myorders.razor. And inside of here, we're gonna start off with a very simple page that says page my orders and my orders will go here. So that's going to, yes, go ahead, rebuild. That's going to now be where we go to. Now it's running on the server. It's going to be server side rendered, right? It's going to be a static page. So when I click my orders, now I get, and I'll wait for the alt tab to go away. My orders will go here. So I have a page that it navigates to. So that's pretty easy to do. Let's add a title to this page and I can do that with the page title um directive here i'll use that component so i'll just save that jump over here and now my page is called blazing pizzas uh give it a second oh go over to my orders blazing pizza my orders all right you see it up there on the tab bar so that happens that works because when you look at our um our app it has these two components, the routes down here, where it's injecting the content of the page. And it has this component up here, head outlet, where it's injecting anything that we specify that needs to be part of the header of our web page. It injects content there from our components, from our pages, 
when we specify things like page title, okay, we can add content into the header of our page. So let me catch up here. Um, it, okay, continuing, here we go. Just keeping an eye on things. Uh, ba -ba. Okay, good, 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 good. All right, so I don't need to look more at that. Here we are on the My Orders page. So let me continue. So there's a little navigation problem here that we're going to to address. Uh, when I'm on the Get Pizza, Pizza page, see how it's highlighted there? It's got a little triangle at the bottom to show this is the page that I'm on. When I go to My Orders, it, it doesn't show me that I'm on this page. This is a nav link versus an anchor. This is a special component that you can use in Blazor that when you're on the page that it specifies, it adds an active class to the anchor tag that it renders. So when I go back over to main layout here, right? The home page is, is the root of the website, so it doesn't actually have a slash or a home page that it specifies. When the href is empty and it's it matches the entire length of the requested path, right? We're on the home page. Highlight that, mark that as active. So when I'm on the my orders page, make that a nav link. So that when I'm on my orders, it highlights and shows that is the active page. So now when I click over there, now it stays highlighted. So when you're building menuing systems in your application, Navlink, instead of just a plain anchor, gives you that extra bit of awareness where your application is in, where your users are navigated through your application so that you can show their information, right? You can show them where they are in the menu. Here's how you got here, all right? That type of thing. So we want to display the list of orders here on this page. It'd be really nice to display the list of orders. So I've already got, right? I've already got a repository that knows how to get and display orders. So let's inject repository and I'll call it repository. So, and I'm, I'm purposely doing this as a repository here, right? Um, because if we decide to move it, it might change. So the default code that was originally delivered said, hey, go get this with HTTP client. We're not going to go get it with HTTP client. We're gonna say repository, uh, get orders async, okay? So it's going to go get all of our orders and return them into this orders with status uh, collection. Now, right, my repository, I'm running on the server now, right, is gonna use this entity framework repository that knows how to join through query and get all of that data. All right, so it's actually doing this behind the scenes. But if I was running on the server, I'd have to use an API. I'm running on in the browser, I'd have to use an API to get that data. So let's update and paint that information. So instead of my orders will go here, let's put a little bit more user interface there. So if we don't have any orders yet, show a little loading information there, a little loading block of text. If we, else if we don't have any orders, so if we did get a collection, but there aren't, if there isn't anything in it, eh, no orders have been placed yet. Hey, maybe you'd like to order some pizza, send you back to the homepage. Otherwise, we're gonna show the list of orders down here at the bottom. And, I thought I, did, did we save all of our pages here? I thought we saved that. Um, where's the rest of my content? Yes. Rebuild. And we'll see what that shows.
Mm-hmm. Here we go. Where's my user interface? Um, think it through, Fritz. What do we got? Order some pizza to show. All the parameters set. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Right, that should be using this. Get orders async. It should return that. What did I miss? No, that's everything. Um, no, why am I not getting any? Oh, oh, it's showing this block. Uh, Okay, so it is correct. I haven't actually, there are orders, but it isn't showing them yet. Okay, I was right. <laughs> um, there's a question in chat uh, on from YouTube. Uh, Slip soon asks, why do I use on parameters async instead of on initialized async? Good question. So these are two of the these are two of the event handlers that run as our application starts, as, as a page starts or a component starts to be rendered. On initialize happens as the rendering first starts. On parameter set runs after any parameters are set about the page that it's going to paint and load. Later on in the series, um, we're going to receive security information about who you are and only show your orders. In order to process and handle that, we need to do it on, in the on parameters, uh, on parameters set event. So good uh, good eye there, Slip Soon. Yeah, for picking that up. Um, parameters in the page model. Uh, yeah, when parameters are set in the page model. So um, you'll see as they as we get to that, okay? So um, the text element is important here for doing razor work because otherwise it thinks that's .NET code. So in order to put a block of text that it doesn't think is .NET code, we wrap it in this, this fake HTML tag called text. That's, that's what the text is. So. Um, all right, so I could go and reset the database so that we see the content that's out there. Um, sure, let me do that. Let me, let me wipe the database real quick. So, um, the, no, that's, that's the right folder. Uh, da, 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 da. so I'm going to drop into the blazing pizza folder and I'm going to delete the pizza database. Um, I need to stop the server in order to do that because it's it's got those files. There we go. And I'll restart. And I'll repopulate. There we go. There's the web page. And if I click through to my orders, no orders placed. So it knows that there are no orders. Um, and if I go and order some pizza, uh, just give me a really big cheese pizza. Just give me a really big cheese pizza. And it didn't actually save the order. I feel bad now. What happened? I thought we, didn't we insert the order? Didn't we insert that? No. Is this, is this one of the things that I forgot to... Um, oh, something that I didn't do last time that I, I hit kind of the, the wrong way here. Um, the interaction for the API to save the pizza is here in a controller. So you need to configure it to allow controllers to be used. 
So builder services, I'm just adding controllers, not with views. Just add controllers, that one. And down here, I need to tell it to actually map and use that. So app.map controllers. So that will, I need to actually restart the application. And it will now be able to save pizzas. We should see the insert occur here. So I'll choose a, I'll choose a pizza. Give me a really big cheese pizza order. And there we see the insert happening. Okay. So if I go over to my orders, not showing any orders yet. All right. Why text instead of span? Um, you could use span, Matthew. Absolutely, you could use span. Um, where I was doing that on the my orders, absolutely, you could use span there. Um, nothing wrong with that. Span just turns will return and show that HTML tag on the page, right? But maybe you don't want to use an extra HTML tag. Then you can use text. So as a tutorial, we want to also teach you about the text tag. You can absolutely use span if you want to, but for a tutorial, we wanted you to learn what the text tag was. So why did I use controllers instead of minimal APIs? Andy, good question there as well. As a tutorial, we wanted to show you that you can mix and match and have more complex order, uh, more complex controllers out here in addition to having some minimal APIs as well for some of the simple requests like get me a list of the specials that are available, get me a list of the toppings that are available. We wanted to make sure that as part of this tutorial, you, shall, you, you were shown here are the various ways that you can build these and they all work together nicely. You have your choice. So, um, how am I logging the raw SQL ca calls while debugging? That is configuration that is available as part of app settings. It's logging all the information by default. So when we're in debug mode, it is going to log all of the info. So Entity Framework automatically shows you at the command line, here's everything. Accessibility semantic HTML usage would make a span a tad questionable. Sure, sure. Maybe a span with a with a uh, with an aria on it to show that it's a um, right to show that it's a label, right? Or it's a it's a content missing message, something like that. Definitely options there. So if we want to return a collection of orders, I have a little bit of code that'll do that. Let me close that. Um, I don't need to look at configure pizza, but yeah, my orders. So right here, let's replace this. So we want to show a list group an orders list. So this CSS is already built for us for each item in our list of orders. So for each order, Item, take a look at the order. Give me the created time. Give me the count of pizzas that were ordered, the total price, um, status, and uh, give us a little track button there as well, right? No, what is it? I, I keep forgetting the format. Uh, format document, Shift Alt F. I thought I, whatever. So, and now when I go over. It's updated and it shows me Wednesday, March 13th. My, my pizzas were delivered. And uh, a little track button there so I can track my order. Now that it's just an anchor and it's, a, it's been formatted as a button, right? But it's going to this page, my orders and then this order ID so we can see more details about that specific order. This page, I want to I want to take a second here and talk a little bit further about this page because um, this is this is something that goes a little bit towards what some of the questions we had earlier were. 
This page is being rendered statically on the server. The contents are delivered as clear HTML here. There is no interaction. Just like the header, there is no interaction with this where we need to do something to interact and do something interesting with the contents on this, okay? What if it takes, to, to one of the earlier questions, what if it takes a really long time to get that data out of the database, right? So what if, like, this takes a really long time, right? I'll put it in for three seconds, right? It takes a really long time to get data out of the database. So it just kind of hangs and I, I get the little spinner there, right? So click over to my orders and I'm kind of I'm kind of hanging, waiting, and eventually it loads. How can how can we mitigate that and provide a better experience with that? Right? So what you can do to kind of get around that and make it a little bit friendlier is with particularly with the server-side rendered content, we can add an attribute up here called stream rendering. And what stream rendering does is it takes anything that we're awaiting, like here, and it will render as much of the website as possible. And while we're waiting for something to happen, it'll proceed and return and repaint in that content when it's done on the server, right? You've seen these places on, in, all over the internet where while you're loading content, YouTube does this spectacularly. While it's waiting to show you some of the other videos that are available, it gives you a little gray square that, that has a gradient that, that, um, that flashes, that pulses for you while it's loading to kind of give you this loading effect. You get this just by adding the stream rendering up here. It's, it's already built in. Look, it says loading, boom. It's a static page. The content is being added and it updates for you. You didn't have to write anything different. But when I click into my orders, it appears immediately. And right now I've got a little block of text that says loading. Put a GIF in there. Put a, a put a, a, a progress bar that fills up. Whatever. This is stream rendering that says ship as much stuff to the browser as you can, and as the rest of the site is finished rendering, paint it in, and that's how that works. Okay, so that's stream rendering for your website doesn't put any extra pressure on your web server, okay? It just works nicely there. A cube spinner, sure, absolutely you could do that. Um, that page is server-side rendering and, and we're calling an API endpoint. No, we're not calling an API endpoint. I'm using a repository that calls, that uses entity framework directly. You could use an HTTP client to call an API endpoint. You can. Stream rendering is for SSR, not WASM. Um, I think you can do it with WebAssembly. I haven't tried it. We'll get. In, we'll, we'll take a look later. So, the My Orders page now is a little bit nicer. Has that live rendering, returning stuff for us on screen, right? I, I feel good about that. But I want to click through and have an Orders display page. How are we doing here? I need to pick up. Need to pick up the pace. So let's add a order details page that'll show here's the details of my order. So I'll declare this is a page that we're going to navigate to. So it's at my orders. And then we want to be able to pass in the ID of the order as kind of as a part of the path. So we use this templating to capture that order, right? We're going to capture it as an order ID and it's an integer, right? So colon integer says this must be a number in order for this page to render. Okay. So I'll save that. And this should, 
should have rebuilt and presented. So when I click track, show, show details for order one. Okay. Um, now, if I, if I try and change that to Fritz's order for dinner and stuff, I get a blank page because that's not my order details page. It, it, that's not where it's going. Change it back to one and it actually knows and it gets there, right? So that's what the route constraint of that int does. It prevents other data types from trying to sneak in here. And there's other route constraints that you can use for your route to make sure that folks aren't trying to hack around and do something that they shouldn't be doing on your website, right? This is th this is a point where folks could try and inject some some code or something that your website doesn't want to be dealing with. So, adding a little bit of that constraint there, it gets cut off at the router and doesn't try to present anything. So, um, let's actually put some some content on inside of our code block here about this order that we're receiving. So that order ID that's specified here is a is going to get copied in and placed into this parameter, right? Order ID is this order ID parameter. And because it's a parameter that we're receiving from outside the page, if we want to work with that, we need to work with it on parameter set. When the page's parameters are set, then we can move forward. Moran asks, what happens if we change that value to two? Doesn't know what to do with it yet. Doesn't know what to do with it yet. So we'll get there. It's coming up. Um, Kodo Melon, um, we're outside the AMA part of today's stream. I will pin that message and I'll try to get back to it when I get to the end of the session today, no guarantees. Okay. Um, no guarantees, but I've, I've got the message pinned there. Otherwise drop me a line on, on Twitter or on the discord and we can take a look. So this page, I want to set up so that it, it goes and pulls for updates and tries to check to see, Hey, do we have any updates about about the current um, order. And the way that it was originally done when it was WebAssembly was it, it used HTTP client and go get it. Well, I'm running on the server. So I'm gonna inject my repository and I'll call it repository. So down here where I would be pulling for updates, instead of saying, go get that order with status, right? Uh, I'm gonna say await repository, get order with status, and I'm gonna pass in my order ID. And you know what? Even before I start trying to pull for updates, just go get a copy of it first. Like, you know how to do that. And I'm going to make this an async task so that it, it runs this asynchronously and tries to get that order with status. And I'm, let's not even do this polling bit yet. Let's make sure that we can get that order. So ID2 would pull data from the database. We need to prevent this. Yes and no. Um, so let me actually put the order here on page. So up here where I would have this, let me add some HTML. If this is an invalid order, let's output an appropriate error message. If we haven't loaded an order yet, eh, put out a message, hey, we're loading. Otherwise, here's when the order was placed, here's the status, and we'll show some more details about the order down here at the bottom. So, let me go back to my orders. Let me take that little timer out, right? I'll even make that 300 milliseconds just so you at least see that it's doing that bit, right? Uh, there it goes. So, Show details for order one, right? Um, we're not getting that content yet. Rebuild. 
Rebuild, let me see. Make sure we got this right, Fritz. There we go. So order details, track it, and there's my content. And I'm doing server-side rendering, and it looks okay here. But if I want to start polling so I can show you how the status is changing, right? That kind of interaction where we're going to check for updates, well, we can't, we can't do that as as a, a loop and push updates into the user interface because it's been rendered and painted on screen. The, this interaction to show, hey, I've got updates. We need to do that interactively. And that brings me to our next rendering mode. Um, server interactive. Before I show that, let me set up the poll for updates so it actually starts processing so you can see that it's rendered statically and isn't going to do anything. So I'm going to set up a task here called a uh, polling task. And I'm going to assign polling task equals poll for updates. And I'm going to have this return a task. Um, and down here at the bottom, right, as it finishes its while, I will return task complete a task uh, oh no I don't need to do that that's okay good so that will run and be hanging out there in the background looks like it restarted let's get another pizza so I'm gonna order one of these one of those and some of this because chat room is hungry let's order place another order here there's my second order, it's preparing, so I'll click track. And I want it to pull and show that, wait a sec, there's a big error back here, hang on. My, my database context has been disposed. Because it's server side rendered, everything's been delivered and it shut things down. Okay, I don't need to do anything more, but that task is still out there running. Huh. We need to clean that up and we want to be able to push that status into the user interface. So this is where interactive server comes in. Okay. So I'll add interactive server just by adding interactive server. Now it says out for delivery. And we should do that refresh. It's going to pull every few seconds. And I'm still getting this error here while it's trying to pull for status. What's going on there? It's trying to pull and it's, it's getting disposed. Let's take a look at what's going on here. So I'm going to bring up the network. I'm not going to get to the state part of this. Uh, let's reload. And it's not actually getting into server mode here. So, even though it's marked as interactive server, let me rebuild. I don't have, watch this. It's in interactive server mode. We need to configure the application so that it knows how to use interactive server mode. You can't just decorate something as interactive server. We need to configure it so that it knows how to use that. So, back to program. And up here, uh, it's up higher. There it is. Where we added Razor components and we added interactive web assembly, we also need to add interactive server so that it knows how to interact with that. Similarly, down here, when we set up the mapping for the routing so it knows how to do that, we need to add interactive server render mode as well. Save those, restart this, and we'll get it. So at this point, now we're also using Blazor Server. That's right, Robson. Yes. How atomic is the server-side rendering of server interactive? Does it resend the whole component level data for updates or only what changed? Um, only what changed. So now it says delivered and look over here. 
it's connecting to slash blazer. Now, if I look at the response, you can see it's passing messages back and forth. This is interactive server. All of your blazer content is hosting and running on the server. And there's a little heartbeat going on where it's sending WebSocket messages back and forth. Very, very small messages back and forth. Um, so that it can be sure that, hey, we're still connected, right? Little three byte message that it's sending. Hey, I'm still connected over here. And it responds with a three byte message so that it's sure that it's connected. All right. But when I navigate away, that connection is automatically closed for us because the front page we know is WebAssembly. So let's recap. Our front page is WebAssembly because we've got some rich interaction that we want to happen in the browser. It's being pre-rendered for us on the server, delivered, and it's handing off control so that you get content running in, in the browser really, really fast, really, really responsive. Okay. When we go to my list of orders, well, this is just a static list of here's your orders, right? It's effectively a, like a receipt, right? So this content, I'm going to statically render. I don't need it to update. There's nothing magical we need to do about this. Let this be server rendered. And the details page here where we're going to update the status, we're going to make this interactive server mode. Robson asks, Blazor server, not Blazor WebAssembly, tutorial purpose? Tutorial purpose. That's right. I could make this static rendered and make just the status a WebAssembly component and have it listen on a socket so just the status updates. But for the purposes of this tutorial, we're going to make it the whole page interactive server so you can see the difference between the various modes and how easy it is to dial up and down those various render modes when you need them, where you need them, okay? Now that I have all three modes available here inside my program file, there's nothing more that I can add. They're all activated and available for me. So let me go back to order details. Uh, I'm already on order details. And let's start adding some more information about the various pizzas here. So I'm gonna create a component that lists Here's the, the contents of the pizza. And that component, I don't know if I'm going to use it on Blazor WebAssembly or if I'm going to use it on server, but you know what? I can put it inside my client library and just use it over there. And I noticed I, I forgot to create a components folder over here in the, in the client library. So I'm going to create a components folder over here. And I'll also add inside of that a pages folder right? So um, I'll put home inside there, right? Home should be inside pages. Uh, I'm going to put configure pizza item inside components there. Configure pizza dialog. That's a component we'll put in there. And um, I'm going to add to my imports up here. Let's make sure we also have Blazing Pizza client components, okay? Um, just to get, make it a little bit neater to kind of see where things are. So let's add an order review component here that'll contain information about, to, to show the various pizzas here. So I'll just copy in some markup that. So for each pizza in our orders collection of pizzas, Show some information about the name of the pizza, the size, the price, and the list of toppings. And then the total price at the end. And this component will pass in an order. Once again, we're going to mark this editor required because you can't show it a, the contents of an order unless you have an order. So let's mark it required. All right. Now, back on my order details page, I can reference and show those details here. So I'll just add a little bit of markup. For that, right, there we go. So track order details, and then there's our order review component, and we're passing in the current order so that it formats it nicely on screen. And what? 
rebuild that. Yes, it does. It does. We added that. It's there. And there it is. So I ordered just a couple pizzas, didn't customize them or anything, and there's my total, right? Kind of a plain user interface there. Let me go back and let's make sure that our polling now works. So uh, order details in the polling area down here. It should try to get the order with status, and then it's gonna call state has changed. Well, state has changed actually happens, right? This is a way for us to force a refresh of content on the user interface. Well, this actually happens outside of the main thread. So we actually have to invoke this asynchronously. So that's one thing that's kind of weird that, that you have to do here. And we'll await that to make sure that it updates the user interface properly. Same thing down here. If there's an exception, we'll invoke that asynchronously. So let's go place an order and actually watch this update. So let's add a, let's take a basic cheese pizza here, make it really big, add some tomatoes. I'd like some extra cheese. Ah, good enough to start here. Place that order. I'll go over to my orders page. There it is being prepared. There it is preparing. And it's going to pull every few seconds and it should now automatically update and paint that status. There it is. You saw it updated and you saw the console go by in the background it updated to out for delivery and in just a few seconds it'll update and show that it's um been delivered okay here's the problem with this page that's right you need to unsubscribe you need to clear up some of these things eventually right this is gonna go through and do its thing and it's connecting to the server and it's checking for updates and eventually that's going to tick over and say delivered and it should update the user interface am i going to use signal to push the updates i that's a little bit further advanced than i want to cover in this you certainly can do that we cover that extensively with tag zap on tuesdays and thursdays and we can talk further about that but for this demo it, it, that's just a little bit further outside the scope that we want to cover there, it automatically updated and shows delivered. It's gonna cancel that task in the background. If we didn't cancel it, it's gonna sit out there and just keep pulling the database for us. So we really need to make sure we dispose and clean up that task for us. So we can implement, we can implement interfaces on our, on our Razor components. So I'm gonna implement iDisposable on this page and go down to the end of this page, right? And right in here, I'll add an implementation for iDisposable. So if we're disposing of the page, if we've navigated away and cleaning this up, cancel that, that token, stop polling, right? So that'll cancel this, the, the task will complete and it will release and it won't be doing any more work in the background. Yes, please restart the app. And there's the restart indicator as it's attempting. There we go, all reconnected. So if I try and order another pizza here, right, and I go back through, it's, we're gonna see it pulling here in the background as it tries to get information about the pizza. Right. There it goes, Nate just updated right there we go so it's updating but if I navigate away there you see it stopped polling right it's not going to poll and pull more, more information right and if we look at the ah, I didn't load the network it's it's completely shut down the circuit it's not connected to the server to do that interaction anymore all right it'd be really great if when I complete the when, when I complete order putting together my pizza and I click the order button here, if it actually navigated to the order details page and showed me that. We can force navigation inside of an application with something called the navigation manager. So I'm gonna go back to the home page and add the navigation manager to the top of this. 
All right. Uh, I'll add it right there. And at the end of the place order method down here, I'm going to have it navigate and go to the page for that order. So place order should actually return a information about an order for me. So when it does a post here, there's actually a response that it gets. And we can inspect and get the new order ID off of that by, thank you, reading that content. So if I go back over to orders controller. So when you place an order, it actually returns the order ID. That's already built for you, okay? So let's get that order ID and let's uh, return that new order ID. Well, that new order ID in order to be returned means this should be a task of type int, which means I need to update my repository. So that returns a task of type int. And I'm going to want to go to my EF repository. See, place order, I don't, I don't even, I didn't even finish out that instance. But it should return a task of type int. So back on the home page. Um, after I place the order, well, let's get that new order ID, right? Um, and let's tell the navigation manager, well, go navigate to, now, thank you, co-pilot, go to my orders for that new order ID. Go show me what what's in my order. Show me the status. So this automatically forces the browser to go to that other page, all right? And yep, looks like everything restarted here. So if I start placing an order, give me a Baconatorizer and uh, I'd like some peppers on that too. Order and boom, navigated me right away over here. They're preparing the pizza. It's, it's a timer and it's gonna come back in just a second or two here and show me that uh, it's out for delivery. There we go. Nice. All right. Um, I've got about 10 minutes left. You know what? Um, state management isn't too, too bad. I can probably... I can probably do this pretty easily. Since our since our homepage and our shopping cart runs in the browser, in this application, we want to maintain our shopping cart that runs in the browser in the browser. So we can put an order state object in the browser so that it remembers it. Because right now, if I go and, and start trying to build an order and I, I go away and come back, it forgets this. So if I want it to remember that order state, I, I can create storage for that. So what I'm going to do is inside my client here, I'm gonna add a new file and I will call this order state CS. It's a C sharp file for order state. Um, let's give this a namespace, right? Blazing pizza client, thank you. Um, and uh, wow, wow, that's not quite what I wanted. But I will start with just a class here. And I'll add this class. I, you're, no, that's not what I want. You're getting ahead of me here, Copilot. So inside of my program on the client, I'll register that so that it's available anytime that I need that state. So I'll say builder services add scoped order state. And now that's available to me inside my home page now, right back to home. And I will not just inject my navigation manager, but I will inject order state. Sure. Call it order state. And that should be it. It's just working in the browser, right? 
So I'll rebuild, let it pick up the, those updates. And, uh-oh, what's this? What's this? There's something in the air. What's this? Cannot provide a value for property order state. Why is this? What's happening, right? It's rendering on the server because it does that pre-render. Well, when it pre-renders, order state doesn't exist. So we need to populate order state on the server also. Even though it's not gonna have anything in it, we've gotta make it aware that, hey, there's a thing here that you're going to want to be able to, to at least reference. So I'll add a using for that as well. Now with that in the mix, I'll restart so that it picks up and has that new dependency injection configured. And now it has the content. How do you get SQLite to work? It should just work. It just builds and makes it available to you. When you restore all of your libraries, it should be there. I need to see what kind of errors you're having. Uh, drop me a message on the Discord or on Twitter with your error, and we can we can take a look further at that. So, so now I have a, I have some place that I can store state about the orders as we're navigating around the application. So let me copy in what our order state is going to manage for us whether we're showing the configure pizza dialogue, the pizza that we're customizing, and the order that we're working on, right? What's in our cart? And we're gonna copy in some of our methods that work with these as well from the homepage so that these, these properties can be pretty much internalized as far as managing, adding, and interacting with them. I'll go back to the homepage and now I'll go into my code down here and we can get rid of, I'm not working on order here. I'm not working on a configured pizza or the pizza dialogue. It's all coming out of my order state. And you see, look at all the red that I have here. So let's start uh, and don't need that method. Show configured pizza dialogue, cancel, confirm, remove. Those aren't part of this anymore. Place order, so we're gonna place the order for my order state order. And I, gosh, order state, I this here, I can say reset order because I, there's a method now here called reset that just clears that out, right? Allows us to do a little bit of, um, uh, oh, what's the solid principle? Uh, open and close principle. But all these places where we're saying show configure pizza dialog, we're going to put order state in front of this. And do, 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 do. good. Here, order state order. Oh, come on. Uh, order state order. Order state remove that pizza. Uh, here we go. Order state order. Right? And we're just moving out that management of these. And here, order state show configure pizza dialog. This is the pizza that we're working on. And those methods in order state. Um, wrong should be that parameter. So by changing all of that over, there it is rebuilding, it's gonna refresh. Come on. There we go. So now when I add a pizza, there's my pizza, I navigate away, come back, and because it's in browser memory, it's not so saved to disk, but it's in browser memory, it remembers and shows this, okay? So we have a way now to persist content in browser memory as we navigate around our application. 
There are other places you may want to store state. You may want to store state on the server, in a database, on disk, some other cache, maybe Redis cache. You may want to store it there so that folks that are logged in, right? You see this with, with storefront websites like Amazon. Doesn't matter if I'm logged in here on this machine or on my phone or another machine or another browser. When I'm logged in, it shows me the same shopping cart because that state is managed on the server. You may want to do that. You may want to save state into the browser, into disk or into a cookie so that it's available later when folks come back in this browser to interact with this website. Those options are available to you and we will talk more about those next time. Let me head back over to, to the chat room here. We are wrapping up. Um, I see a handful of questions coming through. Uh, let me see if I get a couple of these here that I can... Um, sorry, I'm not going to go back and bring things back up, Tony. You can rewind and take a look because I'm right at the end here. Um... Yes, you can also use local storage when saving state. Yes. Um, let me bring look at a couple more questions here. Um, should we use iAsync disposable now? No, because there's nothing asynchronous that we're doing in the dispose method. So, no, you can just use normal dispose there. What are my thoughts on state management for libraries for Blazor, such as Fluxer? They're a great idea. There's a bunch of libraries out there that will take care of that and manage and pass state back and forth between server and client. You can have a great experience with them, um, but it's easy enough to put this stuff in memory for you. Steve on YouTube asks, what's the scope of browser memory? Will it still be there on reload? No. If you reload, if, if you refresh the browser so that it reloads, it will not be there because it unloaded the application. That's where you want to use some things like um, application storage local storage, I'm sorry, in the browser. And that is available for you to work with. You're waiting for Puzzle 26 coming soon. Blazer Puzzle, that's our my other podcast. Ailrath on YouTube asks, if the front page was uh, SSR interactive, would the state automatically be server handled? It wouldn't be automatically server handled, but you could handle it on the server. Yes. By doing a similar, but you would have to persist it somewhere um, specific to that user. Yes. That's all the time we have. We are at time. Thank you so much for watching, friends. We've gone through a lot today. And and there is so much more for us to cover. I, I hope you've enjoyed this. We're going to continue building, iterating, growing this. I'm going to update the, uh, the website with documentation, with more contents on this. If you have questions, if there's content that you have uh, want to dig in further on, contact me on the Discord. Browse to, come on, give me that Discord. There we go. Browse to that URL, discord.csharpfritz.com. You can join my Discord, ask questions there. There's a group of folks that are happy to respond and help you out. I'll jump in there and answer some questions as well. I'm going to try and have some office hours later today where I'm doing some work in working in virtual reality on software development so you can see how that works. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, there's lots of great videos available for you. Check them out over here, down below, over there, somewhere up here. It depends on which YouTube application you're using. There's great content available for you. And if you're watching on Twitch, let's get ready for a raid. Let's see who else is streaming on the big Twitch TV network that we can raid, that we can say hello to, and uh, support them, um, and and have a good time. Um, I'm going to get you connected to. We I think we raided him last time, and I think this is a fine raid. Um, our friend, the bald bearded builder, he's a Microsoft MVP, and he's doing a little bit of co-working time. It's a little bit of chill time to talk and chat with other developers who are doing things similarly and and have that co-working space to uh, hang out and work together. So that is Bald Bearded Builder. His name is Michael Jolly. Have a great time with him. My name is Jeff Fritz. I hope you have a fantastic rest of your day. I wish you good health and good coping.
Take care.